thank you, uh, Briana, for introducing me and uh, inviting me also. Also, thank you to Locomotiva, uh, uh, Kino Cultura, uh, to, to have me here and all the, the partners of uh, Dissonant Core Spaces. Dissonance is something which I'm working on for, I think, now the last five years, so it's very interesting to be in a conference with, with, with such a name. I just say a little bit more about not myself, but my research, because it frames also a little bit what I uh, uh, will say today, and it gives you more an idea where it comes from also, uh, what I will talking about. Uh, uh, I mentioned already I'm a sociologist, so I look much more to the institutional context of, of uh, arts. And... Uh, uh, what I will tell today is in fact based, it started, it's based on different researches, but one was uh, a kind of, it started all with an assignment of um, uh, institutions, art institutions or cultural institutions in Flanders, a part of Belgium, which had a kind of a national identity crisis. They didn't know where they stood for. Uh, because, first of all, they had the question of, yeah, national institutions, we are not Belgian institutions. And also, as art institutions, they didn't want to, uh, how do you say, didn't want to confirm a kind of nationalistic rhetorics of Flanders. So that was their kind of doubting position that they had, and they asked to me, what could be our identity? Yeah, how could we frame, what could be also our assignment to do in society in general? How can we explain? That was the first step. And when I did this research, more and more international, um, I, I, I went to interview a lot of organizations uh, from Portugal to Scandinavia, etc., to look at how they uh, frame and reframe themselves. And uh, out of this came a next assignment of different international organizations um, going from Witte de Wit, uh, the Apple in Amsterdam, um, uh, Reina Sofia uh, in Spain, uh, who asked me in a way the same question, what to do and how to respond nowadays, and I come later to this, to what they called globalization, but they meant a specific thing with globalization, in fact, a very neoliberal kind of globalization in which they have to uh, reframe themselves and even were under pressure by a lot of governments to reframe uh, themselves to get more participants, but which meant often more consumers, etc. So in fact, this lecture is a kind of continuing of, of this question. And it is so it is framed between those, those uh, research reports and this research. One, one book was called Institutional Attitudes, which, which uh, was a starting point. And now still I'm going, uh, I'm doing further research. We have now a team, which is a nice uh, research grant in Flanders at the university, uh, to do research of how to make new uh, artistic um, workings and, and uh, productions also, uh, how, to, how can we make them sustainable on the long run? And how, what is this all about, the question about autonomy? Can they keep their autonomy in those kind of new uh, um, settings in which new liberalism comes in, etc.? And we do this in several cities in, in uh, all over Europe. Berlin is one, London is one, Antwerp is one because we are there, Amsterdam, Naples, Barcelona, etc. And we really look at what is the, what is the relationship also uh, between artists and the city, between artists and citizens also in those cities, um, and what is important for them on the long run uh, to survive. Um, the last thing on which the lecture is, is based um, it's really die-hard sociological stuff, uh, but I will come up not with, uh, with figures or something like that, uh, but we interviewed now, I think, 1,200 1, creators all over Europe, going from architect, uh, architects, opera singers, uh, ballet dancers, uh, web designers, so also commercial and not commercial uh, uh, things, and we just ask them, what do you need? 
to stay on the long run uh, creative, uh, not only in an economical sense, but also in a mental sense, uh, what is necessary and what is, what is all what you need uh, to survive. So in this lecture, I will deal with all these things. How is this institution related also to this kind of uh, trying to make creative processes, creative working sustainable on the long run and keeping uh, uh, autonomy uh, in it? Anyway, as a long introduction, uh, I worked a lot also for my books together with uh, uh, Mark Fisher. Uh, Mark Fisher is, is uh, the author of a beautiful book, um, um, <laughs> Capitalist Realism, was, uh, was the first uh, almost bestseller, I would say. But a much more beautiful book for me in a, in a uh, more sensitive way was Ghosts of My Life. And he uh, describes in Ghosts of My Life, in fact, how the soundscape of London can make you depressive. But I, I started, I promised myself to start uh, every lecture this year uh, uh, dedicating to uh, Mark Fisher because he, uh, he committed suicide uh, the 13th of uh, uh, January this year. Uh, and he, yeah, we had a real great understanding of, of uh, where to go on, also with research and, and what needs to be done also in the research field. Anyway, also this lecture from Mark. Okay, let's start. Institutions. When you Google institutions, you get, I uh, even almost don't dare to say it anymore today after our uh, tour in, in uh, Skopje, but when you Google it, you get this. This is, this is the figure which you almost immediately uh, uh, get when you um, yeah, Google institutions. But for me, it's, it's a very important one because it's a very basic one and it says exactly where let's say, institutions from the 19th century stood for. Um, that means they have a kind of solid foundation where they stand on. They have those pillars, which are vertical. This is very important for me. And they have this kind of arrow which looks at the sky, the grandeur, the ideal where they look for. Uh, that was the kind of, of course, the classical bourgeois 19th century institution uh, uh, where, they, uh, where, uh, where they stood for. So when you still speak out the word of institution or listen to the institution, this, is, this comes often in the back of our heads immediately, this kind of, this kind of picture of what an institution it has a kind of grandeur, uh, certainly uh, in an historical way. And anyway, this is quite important for me also as a metaphor because I think uh, since 19th century, since modernity, let's say, all our, uh, uh, our whole society was built up like that, uh, 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 thought in a kind of institutional way, in the kind of institutional pillars also, who constructed uh, uh, society. So that was not only for the arts, uh, that was also for justice, that was also for the, the state, the welfare state, let's say it like that. Also for science. Uh, uh, they had their own hierarchies, they had their own sky, their own ideal to look for, uh, their own practices they, they did, uh, and their own organizational structures, of course, their own fundament to stand on and underground uh, uh, to believe in. Um, so, for example, let's take uh, one of my uh, habitats. Uh, the university stood for uh, progress, evolution, and science. That's the, the main, main uh, value. Uh, it's all uh, uh, built up around knowledge practice to get more knowledge. That's, that's the basic assumption of a university. And the university, not only as a building, but as an institution, protects also this kind of, of value system. Having said this, it means also that those institutions build a kind of walls between them and other institutions. Uh, they said between de these or those borders here, we have our own value system uh, to build up uh, our own hierarchies of what is good, what is quality, what is, for example, again, the university, what is knowledge and what is not knowledge, what is relevant knowledge and which is not. Those borders are, of course, very important. 
um, because uh, when somebody else, for example, from, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the political system can say, yes, we think we have also our ID what knowledge is, you get a situation like Trump nowadays. Uh, but also they can give assignments to universities to promise to give them also more money, something what happens almost everywhere, at least in Western Europe nowadays. Uh, you get assignments from government and even they try to influence indep independent scientific funds to, for example, do less research on culture but more on creative, creative industries, etc. And there are specific funds for that. There is a direct political influence, and not only, of course, a political influence, also an influence of the market. So that's what I, that's a first remark in general. I think what is important for me uh, is that we see that those borders between those institutions become more and more hybrid. Um, um, there are kind of, yeah, they become even liquid. There are mixtures between them. Um, and that was also, in fact, in a way, in an abstract way, to say what the, 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 the problem was of art institutions uh, when they asked me to do the research. They said, yeah, we have to know, get you know, so many uh, people in it. Uh, we have to sell so much tickets, etc." And that really transforms also how we can, uh, what we can program how we can make exhibitions nowadays, uh, uh, etc. So, and that's my last remark. We can discuss enormously, and we know this of institutional critique, etc. We can discuss enormously institutions, but they had their function. And very, I think, for modern society, a very good one. That was, in fact, uh, uh, protecting their own autonomous, value system, uh, which was very important to get a kind of uh, organization uh, uh, of society. Anyway, let's say this is 19th century and this continues, let's say, until the 70s. 1970s, that at least what I know, Western European uh, uh, um, institutions, but also in the United States, were organized like that. Uh, or with this kind of, of, of frame uh, in it. That men, uh, meant also that it, uh, artists um, had a kind of, and that's for me very important, uh, artists but also scientists, etc., they had their own, let's call it, collective protection system, which protected their own autonomy in a collective institutional uh, uh, way. So, I know I go, now I jump to my question to all those creatives uh, when I ask them, what do you need to survive on the long run? And often they, they look, they longed in a way, they look back to, in a kind of nostalgic way, even when it really does not exist, but to this kind of idea of artistic autonomy, they say, yes, it is very important for me as an artist to develop uh, my, uh, my career and my, uh, my work in an autonomous uh, way. And so then we ask them, what do you need to do this? Yeah. And also, what do you need to do this on the long run? They come up always, almost from the 1,200 we interviewed, we also visit studios, uh, we uh, participate in rehearsals, discuss with them uh, uh, what's happening there. And, at the end, always they come up in with what we call four spheres, which are necessary to, to have, uh, to keep your practice running, and also on the long run. Of course, we mention them like, like that. It's often not uh, mentioned like that in, in uh, direct interviews, of course, so we put it a little bit more on an, an abstract level. Uh, but the first thing what they mention is the domestic space. It's home, the studio. Uh, it's a place where you have respect for each other. Um, it's a place also of tradition. It's the place where you say every morning three cups of coffee before I start painting. Uh, but it's also the place of your own time. It's very important. So it means that you can 
listen endlessly to the same music before you start. Uh, and this, 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 this is very important, I think, that you have the feeling that you can control your own time and you can lose yourself also in your own time. Uh, but it's also the place of, of rituals, of, of intimacy and trust. A lot of artists said literally in the interview, uh, when my, some, most of the time when they said, when my girlfriend comes in and she says, this work never show to the work, I will destroy it. This is a very personal relationship which you can have only in this domestic space, which is very important uh, for your own reflection uh, and, and uh, creation of your work. The second space they mentioned is the peers. The peers is the space where you discuss for the first time in your life most with professionals. Uh, uh, it can be, for example, an art school um, where you come in and uh, you talk with professors, but also with colleagues or stu uh, uh, students. Um, and interesting is in this in this setting. Um, Probably the, 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 the relationship is uh, still structured uh, around respect, but certainly also around evaluating. And this is all, uh, this always in a professional context. When you're talking with each other in a professional context with the peers, you always know that you can be evaluated. Yeah. Everything what you say, everything what you do. Even when a student goes with his uh, professor for a beer after school, he or she knows everything what I said can be evaluated yeah. uh, uh, in my process. So it's a, a different kind of relationship you build up uh, uh, with the peers. You are for the first time also related with a kind of canon, art, histor uh, art historical knowledge as an artist. Uh, and it is also about negotiation and discussion, which is very important to the peers. As an anecdote, I always use um, what a student, um, no, it was not anymore a student, was already an artist, but he, he talked about uh, discussions uh, uh, in school. And he mentioned that uh, um, the, the professor came in the studio where they were painting. And then often the professor said to a student, oh my God, what you are doing is still Van Gogh. And then the artist said, or the student says, no, I'm doing something else. Right. This is the really fight, the discussion uh, between the canon, knowledge, and uh, in the trying to find an, an individual position. So peers is very important, when, but when you want to make a living of your uh, uh, work, you need a market. Uh, a market we define very broad. It can be also getting subsidizing. But what I mean is that you can exchange your artistic things you do for money, yeah. that you can make a living. Uh, uh, of it. That's for me a market uh, condition. We all know markets, again, the relationships are completely different uh, framed there. It's all about competition. Uh, even when you get subsidized, you know, when I get subsidized as an artist, maybe this uh, other artist didn't get uh, subsidized. There's always a kind of competition uh, uh, between them. And a very important quality of the market is that it learns you to quantify. Yeah. It learns you to count, literally, how much time does it take to make an artwork? Uh, how much time does it take to work to the deadline for an exhibition, uh, uh, theater performance, uh, etc.? So learning to count is a very important, again, quality uh, uh, of the market. I mentioned already it's all about uh, uh, money relationships and uh, trained and uh, uh, exchange. I put it there as a kind of ideal, typical example, the auction, because the auction is maybe the most pure form in the art system, uh, which is a market system, uh, because you can, uh, the only rule which counts in an auction is that you have money to pay the work. That's the only thing what counts. You, uh, it's not necessary to, to, to know anything about art, it's not necessary to know the artist or even um, a creator who knows the artist. Uh, the only thing which counts is, is that you have the money uh, to sell. So having said that, it means also that most also private art markets and commercial art workers are not pure markets. Most of the time they are not. They are a mixture uh, of things. The last space which is very important, which also the artist mentioned, is uh, a civil space. 
Civil space is the place where your work is represented, criticized, where it's uh, discussed about the quality of your work. But I mean, uh, that's also why I mention uh, or call it civil space. It is also the discussion about your work, not only in artistic uh, sense of as artistic quality, but also as uh, uh, the quality for a general culture. Uh, and this is a very important place where you get, uh, in argumentation, a very, or can get at least, a very broad uh, public support. This is also the place where sometimes nationalistic art is made, of course also, uh, where uh, um, a civil society use their, uh, um, choose their uh, artistic symbols. Uh, for a society, for a group, a community, uh, uh, etc. What we see, and I mentioned already, there is a kind of liquidity between uh, subsystems nowadays, that there is a lot of confusion, for example, between the civil value nowadays and the market value. Uh, I mentioned already uh, a lot of arguments in uh, politics nowadays are that, for example, as an institution has civil support and public support because they sell enough tickets. Uh, that's the typical reasoning which comes in uh, uh, more and more. But there is, for me, a huge difference. And I can only mention this with an anecdote. It's an anecdote about, about uh, at least in Belgium, a famous uh, museum director. Uh, his name was Jan Hoed. He died, I think, now already uh, four years ago. Uh, he did also Documenta, I think, Documenta 1989, uh, etc. So it was a, a serious public uh, uh, figure. Uh, but he had, until 2000, he started his collection of uh, contemporary uh, art in uh, 1975. Uh, but he had to fought in the city of uh, Ghent for his own museum. And he, uh, he got it only in 2000. It was a long struggle uh, uh, for him to, uh, to get it. But there was a kind of survey on the, uh, for the citizens of Ghent in which they asked if they wanted to support a museum of contemporary art. They did it in, um, in 1995. Anyway, in this survey, 95% uh, of the people answered that, yes, we want a museum of contemporary uh, art. They ask also, when the museum will be there, will you go? 10% answers, yes, we will go also to the museum. And that's, for me, a very important thing. That's, that's the difference between the civil uh, uh, support for something that says, yes, we think it's important that we have a museum for contemporary art. That does not mean that you have to buy a ticket and go. That's something else. That's, that's the difference between a civil value and, uh, I think, a market value. Two things still about this. First of all, when you look at the careers of artists, most of them, they start in the domestic space, of course, then go to school. So there is a kind of logic in time in this, uh, in this frame. But, and this is very important, they stress and uh, especially very successful artists stress that uh, it's very important to find a balance between those four spaces. For example, famous artists like, like Luc Teumans, a Belgian painter, literally said, uh, it's awful when you have 10 years success because you are only surrounded uh, only by groupies, by people who are fans of your own work, and they don't criticize you well anymore. Yeah. So I miss the peers. It's very important. So to have time to go back sometimes to the peers or uh, the domestic uh, space. And the last remark with this, and this is for me more important, I think, those spheres were, let's say, until the 1970s, protected by institutions. For example, let's take the domestic sphere, was protected by the institution family, who, who protected in a, a big sense, and most of the time it was, of course, it's a, it's a gender discussion, but most of the time it were the wives of artists who made it possible that an artist uh, could experiment for 10 years before, uh, before it became successful. 
We all know what happens starting from the 70s with those institutions like families, but also museums, also universities, uh, the civil uh, space. They, in a way, um, are destructed. Right? They, they uh, um, disappear. And that's, that's a very important thing, I think, what happens. They do not anymore, on a collective base, protect those values in those systems. Oh, I went back, sorry. So, what happens in a way, and I talk now in an abstract way, the world becomes again flat and even wet again. So not anymore vertical are organized like those institutions. It becomes flat and wet and we are more and more, we are surfing on the surface from project to project. And this is a, a mechanism what I think is, is uh, started from, uh, from the 70s and had to do with a kind of um, historical evolutions which all took place, let's say, quite blunt, between 1970 and 2000, uh, but they all were in the same time frame uh, they took place. And one, is, uh, one historical shift is what I call from politics to post-political, or you could also mention it from the welfare state to uh, uh, the neoliberal uh, state, which I call repressive liberalism. I come later to this why I call it not neoliberal, but repressive liberalism. Uh, but that means also the fall of the Berlin Wall, of course, the, the kind of whole discussion, uh, are there still ideological oppositions, etc. This happens in this, uh, for me in this time frame. A second uh, shift we see is what I call in sociology of labor, the shift of Fordism to post-Fordism. Fordism comes from Henry Ford, who had a kind of system to organize labor, uh, and post-Fordism stresses much more creativity, flexibility, etc. All happens starting from the 70s. The last historical shift is what I call the shift from modern to contemporary art, that we call ourselves a contemporary artist, or that a museum, the first museums of contemporary art and not any more modern art, at least in Belgium, were raised in the mid of the 80s, the 1980s. Which I call also, yeah, you've seen it a lot, post, 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 post Fordism, post political, uh, but also maybe uh, becomes a kind of post art. What is interesting, I think, at least in Europe, is that they all stand up on a kind of base uh, or an ideology or idea of uh, that there can be a unified system uh, where we can stand up and we, on which we can build uh, politics, and that is a unified uh, uh, market, of course, at least uh, for Europe which builds a kind of utopia of a monotopia né, that you can exchange from one place to uh, another in an easy uh, way. So the world becomes flat and wet. We can surf on it. Uh, and I think th those three evolutions are uh, the main reason on a kind of macro-sociological level which which changes a lot and influences enormously our institutions uh, nowadays. What does this mean for the frame? It's a classical one, of course. The market grows. And the market takes over other fields in this uh, uh, thing. As such, I said already, the market has a beautiful quality, and the quality is that it learns to quantify yourself. But uh, there happens something very strange when this also this qu quantifying logic uh, comes into other spheres. And I think this is really happening uh, uh, yeah, nowadays. Again, it starts already from the 70s. So what starts is when the market takes over other spheres, you get a kind of what I call a measure obsession. People try to measure everything. And I will give some examples in a second to make sure this clear. For example, what I see at home with my own children, they don't sit when they want to uh, draw something, they don't sit anymore for a white paper. No, they have the iPad. 
and the iPad has its own uh, programs for design, etc. So what is interesting is what we see is already that crea uh, creativity is al already, before we can be creative, is formatted, is quantified. We, we heard this a lot in interviews with architects when they talk about design programs. They said, yes, of course, they, they, they uh, measure already the risk before you start thinking about your design. It's very interesting that this happens. So this, this happens already in the domestic sphere. This, uh, that's why I call it also home entertainment. A lot of home entertainment does this. Eh? It's a formatted creati creati creativity. In the peers, let's take an art school. We have at least, I saw it uh, growing and growing in the Netherlands, where I worked for 10 years. You have this kind of courses, creative industries coming up, cultural management, arts management in universities, but also uh, in art schools. And what do they learn there? They learn to measure themselves. I, I uh, worked for eight years at uh, the Fonte School of Arts in Tilburg in the Netherlands, where they have a fabulous rock academy. And they had also courses, creative industries, and the teacher, which was a cultural manager, creative industries, uh, teach literally, or said literally to the, to the students, when you make today a pop song, four and a half minutes. No 70 minutes anymore. You don't sell it. It's learning to format your own creativity. That's what is happening there. Uh, and in, in the civil space also, you see the whole development of creative cities, uh, creative industries, and what they learn to do is to calculate, to count. For example, literally in the policy plans of Guggenheim Bilbao stands 80% dead artists, because dead artists sell better exhibitions. They know it. So they calculate before they start programming and doing the artistic program. Or you see a lot of museums, and that was also a complaint we had also in Belgium, that they, for example, take, need to take one exhibition of a kind of fa uh, famous uh, artist, the last in Groningen, David Bowie, hmm? uh, and then, then they can do another exhibition with a more experimental uh, uh, qualified artist. So this, this is also measuring. It's measuring uh, this space. It, it looks still like a civil space, the public museum, but in fact, it is calculated. Everything is calculated. So this is happening, I think, in what we call uh, uh, a neoliberal uh, system, and is still continuing, I think, today, and it influences enormously our institutions. This means also that the art world itself is organized in a different uh, uh, way. It's organized literally as an economy, but then as an economy of ideas. And this functions quite different in that sense that no, mat not material objects are uh, not anymore uh, sold, also they are still on the market, but also more and more ideas are sold. For example, when you uh, are invited as an artist to make, I said already, to make a work for a biennial, the curator don't know what you will make. Yeah. So, in fact, what he is, when you get a contract at all, when he's contracting you, he's contracting an ID. He hopes for an ID that you come and realize there. But it's also, I think, with a lot of assignments in the theater field, etc., it's the same thing. You, you trust somebody, of course, because an artist maybe had already a, a career, but then you contract, in fact, an ID. This is, this is a, a a very interesting, I think, phenomenon. So, what is Im important is, I asked a lot of curators, but also festival programmers, etc. I asked them often, uh, why do you ask this artist to, to uh, make a piece of art here? Or why, I ask also boards of biennials, why do you invite this curator to do, to do the biennial of Venice, for example, etc. Is it all about name and fame? Sometimes it is, but when they choose it for an integral way, most of the time it's not. Is it because they are good managers, 
most of the time they are not. There are a lot of complaints uh, about uh, curators exactly uh, that they are not good organizers. But when they ask them uh, to come in, again in an integral way, they say, yes, we hope and we think that she or he will come with a good ID. That's, that's the main reason. Question is then, of course, what is today a good ID? When you go to this and, and you ask them, the first thing what they say is a good ID is still very modernist. It's a new ID. You have to come up with something new, otherwise it's not a good ID. It's a very classical way of reasoning. But the second thing which comes in, and comes in from the 80s, and that's more and more important, I think, is that you cannot come up with only a new ID, you also have to come up with what we call an appropriate ID. It needs to relate to the context where you make something. As a, as a young curator nowadays, do, uh, do one thing certainly not, do not just copy the same exhibition from New York and Istanbul, they shoot you. You have to relate it to the context. So a new idea is, a good idea is not only a new idea, but needs to be more and more also appropriate idea. The same counts for artists to make installation arts. It needs to relate to the social, political, economical context where uh, uh, they make it. So a good idea is also always a kind of opportunistic idea. And I don't mean by opportunistic in a moral sense. It's just taking the opportunities of where it happens. So, but what is interesting in this whole system is, of course, you never know if somebody will realize his or her good idea at the spot. So, what is contracted is only a potency of a good idea. And this makes this whole economy of ideas very ephemeric. Uh, it's very difficult to control or to know if somebody comes uh, with a good uh, ID. So this means also that this whole context needs to be organized in a completely different way than the classical institutional uh, uh, way uh, in the past. And how is it organized? It's organized what I call in, in, uh, in scenes. So it's not anymore a market, it's not anymore the institution of, of uh, um, uh, classical factory almost, which was a museum with the white walls where you come in and says, here is autonomous art uh, between these white walls. It's more and more organized like a scene. What is the scene about? First of all, the scene, especially creative scenes, are promoted nowadays everywhere as a, a kind of economical tool. Right? Uh, I mentioned there the, the name of Richard Florida, who uh, probably uh, uh, you all uh, know, um, who has written books like The Rise of the Creative Class, or Know Your City, very important. And he says, literally, when you want to have still a flourishing economy, you need to have so many gays in your city, so many creatives in it, etc. You need to have tolerance, and that's good for your city. It's a kind of economical tool. And it's very influential still, this work of Richard Florida. It's discussed a lot because of its methodology that is not quite correct, etc. But it is very influential. We did a kind of, of test in, in, in the Netherlands in 2011. We counted uh, of uh, uh, all the com uh, governmental communities, so not only cities in the Netherlands, uh, um, how many of those communities mentioned in their cultural policy plans the name of Richard Florida? Only two did not. So it's very influential, uh, this thinking about creative cities. So not anymore cultural cities, but creative cities. Uh, not more, anymore cultural policy, but creative policy. Creative Europe, same thing. So, uh, question is, of course, then, what is this scene about and how does it function? Uh, um, and then I had to look up back in my first year uh, handbook of sociology uh, to take a look to, to, uh, to study what a scene is. A scene is not a group. A group means, when you look at the classical definition, a group is as membership. Yeah, mem membership cards can be in and out. A scene is much more liquid. 
organized. It's also not a subculture, like the punk movement, etc. All the same clothes, all uh, the same music. Most of the time it's not, but the scene has an identity. So it's not also a category, like all the, uh, the women of 18 years old in Macedonia. They have no self-identity, that's a category. So a scene has an identity, but not so strict as uh, uh, a subculture. Now, what is the scene doing? And this is for me uh, very important when you look at, first of all, you can fly nowadays from the one scene to the other, and you can feel quite immediately at home. When you are, for example, an artist in the visual art world, you can easily fly from Tokyo to Brussels, from Brussels to New York, and you immediately know, oh, now I'm on the scene. You know the right pubs, you know the museums where you need to be, uh, uh, etc. So this is, a, this is a very important thing. The scene is a global phenomenon and organizes labor in a global system. And what it does, and this is typical, it organizes, in fact, the mixture between domestic and working space. The best assignments as an artist you don't get in a kind of office with neon lam lamps. No, you get it at the opening of an exhibition at the reception, the opening or the premiere of, an, of a theatre piece. The, uh, afterwards, you sit together, you talk with each other, etc. There are pubs and, and uh, stif uh, specific parties. So what is, what is doing in this, this whole system? It's mixing, in fact, the domestic and the working space. And that's the, what the scene does, what the, uh, the scene does for us. So it organizes a kind of informality. It was also funny when I interviewed curators they often uh, uh, mentioned, yes, my friend Boris Kreuz and my friend Michelangelo Pistoletto and my friend, I was so oh, amazed, you have so many friends, it's amazing. But it, it's, it's a kind of very strange mix. Sometimes it's really friends, they share even the bed with each other, and sometimes it, it's just professional knowledge. But there's this very gray zone between this, and this is, this is really an economical thing, which is very important. Uh, Nowadays, how the art scene is uh, organized. But to be a scene, you need to be seen as a scene. This is very important. But also in your professional life, you need to be on the scene. You need to be seen on the scene to be on the scene. Yeah? So this is very important. This means also that your public life is part of your professional life. You need to play theater, always. Because you get in public space your or public, semi-public spaces like openings, etc., your assignments for your new uh, uh, job. So this is this is a very important uh, uh, space uh, which organizes which organizes also in cities a kind of creative dynamics, but also a creative economy uh, uh, of it. And this is very important. Also, it's also a new way of sanctioning or controlling. Uh, people. When you work in an economy of IDs, it means that an, econo an ID is worth money. At least symbolic capital, but also economical capital at the end. So what is very important when your IDs are worth money, it's very important that you never trust on the four eyes your IDs. Because somebody else can steal your ID. That's also the big gossip. So, what does the scene organize for you? That you can talk and test your ideas while people are standing around you and that they can say, oh, that was his ID or that was her ID. And this is very important. This is a kind of sanctioning system of the economy uh, of ideas. So, but we have the feeling, we have the feeling that we can travel for free all over the world from scene to scene but in fact, it is the scene which makes you work. Eh? This is the feeling of freedom, which is promoted very well in the artistic scene, and I come later to this also. But in fact, it makes you work. You need to be there. You need to network. You need to be connected. You need to serve from place to place. Otherwise, you don't get assignments. Eh? So this is a very strange thing. You are free to do because you are a freelancer, eh? most of the time, those professionals. You are free to do, you have your own autonomy, but in fact, this makes you work. And this is the very strange paradoxical 
uh, relationship you have as an artist, I think, in this scene. By the way, it's a beautiful lecture of uh, Hito Sterl, an, ar an artist living in Berlin. Uh, she made a kind of in a lecture, uh, well, I think it's now eight years ago, I was in, 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 in Tate Modern with her in the debate and lecturing. And, and she, she made a kind of beautiful genesis where the word freelancer comes from. It is the person 2,000 years ago, it comes from the samurai with somebody with a free lance uh, who can be hired by the best bidder. And this is a very interesting uh, position, I think, to think about. A lot of artists are now in this kind of freelance positions, but also commercial creatives, uh, uh, etc. A freelancer, a person who is hired to fight, has better not an ideological or political opinion. He's better not in a union. Uh, he's, uh, so, and this is this is very important. I think this is all this this whole idea of free free uh, dom is completely uh, wrapped up in a kind of system uh, which which uh, which can control you. And that's what I call uh, uh, what the scene is also organizing for us. And it is not anymore state control or something like that, central organized. No, it is we. We, we control each other in this, in this kind of uh, system. So, and this art scene, in fact, how it is organized and how it also is copied, promises, in fact, and promotes even what I call neoliberal uh, labor uh, ethics. But it has to do so also uh, enormously with control. And that's also the reason why I don't talk anymore about neoliberalism nowadays. Because when you translate neoliberalism literally, it means new freedom. It's totally not new freedom at all. It is in fact, what you see nowadays, it's a regression of the old idea of liberalism of the 19th century in a completely different way. And it's, it's a regression and also a repression. I try to explain what I mean by this by, by three quotes. The first one comes from um, Hans Achterhuis, but first I'm going to take some water. Um, the first one is, is from, from uh, Hans Achterhuis, it's a Dutch philosopher, uh, and the quote comes from the book, The Utopia of the Free Market. Um, I don't know if it's translated also in English or something, so it's only in Dutch, but anyway. He says, while governments cut back everywhere and relegate tasks to the market, the supervisors who must guard the freedom of that market grow and grow and grow. See the very strange paradox. Say, we give it to the market, also the state says, yes, you can do it, we give it to the market, but in the meanwhile, the control grows. It's a very interesting mechanism, I think, and I, he illustrates it um, by giving an example uh, of the healthcare system in the Netherlands. He says, uh, he mentioned, he mentions in this book an economical study who measures uh, the, the part of the GDP who goes to healthcare in the Netherlands. And they privatized in the Netherlands in 2006 healthcare by a new healthcare law, I call it blunt like that. Uh, and what is interesting, what this economist says in his analysis, he saw that they spend it for uh, the part of the GDP who went to healthcare in the Netherlands was in 2005, so before the voting of, uh, of this new law, was 7.2%. So 7.2% of the Dutch people spend it money for healthcare, medicines, hospitals, etc. Uh, of the part. In 2008, so two years after the voting of this law, it was already 13.2%. Very strange. You privatize a system, you think prices go down because you have competition, no prices went up. Then question is what Archidus asks, why? How come, could this happen? Well, what is very interesting, of course, when you privatize such a thing like healthcare, it's about the quality of life and people, you have to control. But that they did already in the Netherlands, very strict state control of healthcare systems audits, for example, of hospitals, etc. But what they did also in 2006 is privatizing the control. So what does this mean? 
that you get a lot of offices, audit offices, private companies, who bid to be the best controller. They fight for God, they compete with each other, and they even say literally in their, in their commercials, etc., when we control you, you are sure when the government comes, you get your subsidizing again. Because we control us the best. We control holier than the Pope. But that's what you get when you get competitions of controllers. Of course, you get a very rigid system. Maybe you get de deregulation, like neoliberalism stands for deregulation, but the rules who still exist are very rigid, followed up. And you get also a lot of audits, control uh, systems in it. And this is, of course, not only for healthcare. This happens everywhere in education nowadays, in the cultural field. Museums complain and complain again of the, uh, about the next audit which will come, or accreditation which will come, at least uh, uh, in Europe. Just one anecdote, I worked for 10 years in the Netherlands at three, two uh, educational organizations. One was a university and one was a higher art school. I had seven audits in 10 years. Uh, and the last, last company who did it was a kind of private company who did a pre-audit. Because, of course, schools think, ah, oh, we do first a pre-audit, and when we have done, done this, then we are safe for when uh, the real audit comes uh, from the government, uh, etc. The last office was called, which I had, was called control. Because control is a good thing. But this is the whole system, I think, which we are in. Be autonomous. Take your own freedom, organize your own education, organize your own museum in your own program, do it in an autonomous way, but we organize the control. And this is the very strange paradoxical thing I think nowadays uh, we are in. It's also happening in the United States, but I, uh, that's why I quoted Lessig uh, uh, in it, but I can't, and it's certainly in culture. Uh, I don't go in depth to this because then we lose too much time. But I want to remark um, or refer to a book which I've read when I was 19 years old and I, I didn't like, understood it at all at that moment. It was The One Dimensional Man of Herbert Marcuse. And exactly this quote I could completely not uh, understand at that moment. And there it stands, he says, under the rule of a repressive whole, liberty can be made into a powerful instrument of domination. See the paradox. It's a very, make people on the individual level as free as possible, and you have all the tools in your hand to make a very authoritarian, uh, authoritarian uh, regime. Maybe he put it a little bit blunt in the 60s, but I think this is more and more going on in what I call repressive liberalism. This is the whole kind of paradox in which you are living. I know I really have to drink something. Again, what does this? Back to this. With our biotop for artists and therefore squares uh, on the macro level, I think what is happening nowadays, and let's say as a symbolic date, it happened after uh, 2008. You get in this system a very strange, what I call feedback. A feedback on the market itself, on the classical market. And, and in the first slide with this, uh, with this scheme or biotop, I mentioned also in the market the name of Adam Smith. It's very interesting. Uh, I think because Alan Smith is always uh, seen as a kind of representative of the liberal system and this, uh, what was it, this health of where, uh, uh, the wealth of uh, nations. It's interesting that he also indeed promotes in a way a market as a kind of global social system which is good for society when you organize society like that. But even in this book, he already mentions, they say, yes, you can do this, but do this never for two fields. So never organize two fields in society as a market. Healthcare, education. Because, and that's, that's his remark, he says, when you do that, then you destroy the market itself. 
a classical functioning market. And this is, I think, what is happening nowadays. For example, my son at home is downloading illegal completely. He's changing programs with patterns so that he knows how to do it. And this is very interesting. Of course, this whole thing of piracy, of course, blocks and deconstructs a classical functioning of a market, how it needs to function, or at least how it needed to function since the 19th, 19th century. Creative industries do the same. It's very interesting. When you learn your students at school to make only pop songs of four and a half minutes, of course, you ca uh, get a kind of system which, uh, which is formatted. And every artwork looks like the same other artwork. You get isomorphism in this. But even in a very strong competitive market, it's very interesting what happens then. People who are in competition with each other are always looking to each other and says, oh, she is doing this or he is doing that, so I need to do just something else. Then it will be different. This is distinction in, in the market. But of course, because you always are looking to each other, what the other is doing, you look more, you are mirroring each other. So you get a kind of competitive isomorphism, a homogeneity of products in it, which is in fact very bad for a market system which needs to be differentiated. And the last one, cultural industries, when it comes in, beautiful example was already, I think, um, uh, the majors in pop music, uh, music nowadays, we still have three majors. Monopoli uh, monopolization, you see it also in the whole uh, ICT uh, industry, uh, etc. A monopoly is, of course, problematic for the functioning of a market. So this is, I think, this is the system in which we are now. And creative labor is made in this kind of context now since, let's say, again, symbolically uh, 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 2000 uh, uh, and eight. So this means also, okay, the market growed and took over all the spheres, but it has a kind of very strange negative feedback on the functioning of the market uh, uh, itself nowadays. So question, what to do? Well, let's start with another idea, uh, what I try to promote in the next book. Uh, and this is the whole idea of what I call communism, communism with an O, not with a U. Uh, to, uh, to be clear. What is this about? Uh, and I try to make it, make it very specific in, in, in the next slide, but now what is it first of all about? First of all about, I think, um, what is very important is that communism recognize that not uh, economy is the base of a society on which we stand, but culture. What do I mean by this? Culture, what is culture about? In a very broad anthropological sense, it's, it's culture means um, uh, a big machine which gives you the possibility to signify yourself. It's a machine of signification, giving meaning. That's culture. Giving meaning to yourself, giving meaning to your context, etc. That's That's culture about. So when you think so in that sense about culture, I think communism and liberal, uh, neoliberalism make a big mistake. They think and they see both, even when they are the ideological opposites, they take economy as the base of society on which it stands. I think we have to turn this around. First step to come to another idea. Because for me also economy the way or a free market as an ID is a cultural product. It is a whole end of or an effect of a process of signification. How we signify things and when we understand this, I don't say there is good or bad culture, can be good or bad culture, but when you understand it like that, when it is the base, it means also you can signify everything in a different way. Also economy. So that's, that's for me the starting uh, uh, point uh, to think about this communism. Communism is not, or the commons, is not a harmonic community. That's the second thing. I think common, uh, communism, or the commons, 
is the organization of things you can use for free. It's for everybody. But of course, that means also that you have to regulate what is for free and what, and uh, what are the conditions to use things in, uh, uh, in this space. So this means also it can be very agonistic. What I mean by this is when you, for example, know we have those in Antwerp, we have it also, but in Berlin I've seen it, where you have those common gardens. When you come in and say, oh, beautiful red tomatoes for me, of course you have a discussion with your other uh, partners that no, no, they are for me. So you have always this discussion, and this is organized in the commons, but this is very important also that this, this kind of dissensus, that's what I also like very much, is dissonant. Uh, uh, space is very important. It's about the census, uh, discussion again and again. So it's not about a beautiful community, harmony, 60s, uh, etc. It's really about fights, discussions uh, about who can have. So it's also not like free beer, that everybody can have a free beer. You know, it is like free speech. It means you can have it, but then you also have to use it to invest again in it and to make it public again. So this is a very important uh, 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 principle. And it's for me a multitude of singularities. That means also that a lot of people can come in, a lot of individuals, and say, this is for me, or I add this to the commons, my singular thing, like an artist who makes something in public space. So, and this is, my main point also, I think that when I come to constitutions, that art can, in this way, constitute the commons by bringing in very different singular things. When does the commons exist? This is for me very important. As a public space also, it means that, first of all, let's start there. The commons, or also public space, does not exist. It needs to be made again and again. And when, when is it made? It is made when you can bring in something different, which somebody else says, oh, not for me, or what is this about? Uh, this is happening again and again. This is, then are you feeding the commons of differentiation? That's also why it's a multitude of very different uh, singularities which you bring in. So it is about bringing in singular proposals again and again and again. Uh, this is very important. I know this sounds quite abstract, but I try to make it more specific in the next slide. Back to what does this mean of how we can organize, again, our creative lives and creative careers also uh, on the long run. I think we have to think about how we can take from a civil position, uh, let grow this kind of new sphere uh, of commons. This means also public institutions. What can they do? They really have to think about what can we, uh, we do to share information for free, to share creativity, to share knowledge uh, 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 again. And there are very specific examples which are very, you can very, really touch. I know it's, I hope, less uh, abstract. For example, it's just really about thinking as a museum or an art school to organize in the domestic sphere common knowledge. That means just building a website which is open for everybody. Wikipedia, it's very classical, this kind of stuff. Bringing it in, trying to intervene like the market did, but trying to intervene as a public institution in this domestic uh, sphere. Make things for free again there. It means in the peers, like in our school, also talking and thinking again about politics. And I don't mean party politics. I mean really about politics means for me giving form to society. It's really, so it means that you discuss with artists also in, or coming up artists in an art school, asking the questions, why do we need to become today all cultural entrepreneurs? Where does the word entrepreneur comes from? What does it mean when you define yourself as an artist, as an entrepreneur, etc.? So it is really about the definition of your own position. Uh, in this, what is for me 
uh, uh, politics and why it is, uh, I think, important. But it means also intervening in the market itself, right? trying to break open a kind of market system by uh, delivering common goods. And there are a lot of examples. Creative Commons is one of it. Uh, it's a license who makes it uh, possible. But there are beautiful examples. We are now studying in our research the city of Naples, where they have the first commissioner, um, commissioner, councillor of the world for the commons. It's very interesting. So as a, a, a government of a city itself says, we need spaces uh, which we need to safeguard, and even organizations, we need to safeguard in the city where we, and there are a lot of theaters there, who can organize themselves in their own economy, in their own logics. We uh, deliver them, uh, give them the buildings, but they can organize themselves and have to also find their own income. It's a very kind of tricky thing, but anyway, it is a kind of, but they do. Yeah? And you see a lot of this kind of organize, uh, organizations, what I call between the market and the state, trying to organize themselves. And sometimes it are also mixtures. Uh, that sometimes they have private money, then they have subsidizing, but they do something else. They try to make kind of autonomous organizations of that. There's a lot of experimenting uh, going on uh, there. But what is interesting, it makes culture, but also education, much more cheaper. And it makes much more also democratic because the discussion is always going on about uh, this. So, Maybe uh, uh, almost to end, it's not important, I think, uh, to make political art or activist art, etc. Of course, this is important, but not uh, that, the, that, that the message needs to be that. It's much more to think about how we can organize our art politically. What I mean by this is thinking about, even when you make abstract painting, it's important how do I organize my abstract painting in society? And that's a completely different way than just doing the message, uh, giving the message, a political message, uh, uh, etc. That's also why I use this quote of uh, Thomas Hirschhorn. We can discuss his work. That's something else. But I like very much uh, this quote. Uh, at least he says, I'm concerned with making art politically. I'm not concerned with making political art. So it's really about thinking about what is, how can I position my art uh, in society? Next thing I think also what is important is to get over this whole idea of contemporary art. In the contemporary art, which is organized in scenes, etc. It's very important to think as an artist, and this comes from Theo Geoffrey, I always forget how to mention his name. Uh, which is, I say, we have really have to take a look at what is very urgent in society nowadays to deal with. Uh, and we have to get over this kind of, of, of contemporary uh, in, in society. To give just, I, I wound up uh, with, with two or three examples who try to do this. And sometimes in a political way, I mean by content-wise political, sometimes not. This is a circus, Circus Amok in, in New York. Uh, they play, uh, this is uh, Jennifer Miller, the, the woman with beard is the director, and they make, most of the time, circus for children in public space. And there it comes, what they do is they build the circus um, in squares in New York or parks, which are all privatized, or the community around it enclosed it that nobody else could in anymore and control it also. And they go there and say, no, this is a public park. We put our tent here and we make circus here. Even when it is sometimes only to laugh, etc. the content-wise is very important. I also use the circus because I think the circus is for me a very strong metaphor to think about new institutions nowadays and how they can organize themselves. First of all, a tent of a circus is also vertical, but it is put up again and again. Also, a tent is mobile. So a tent is also, um, yeah, you come somewhere and you put your, your place there and says, we are going to make here for a while our autonomous space for art. So this, this mechanism is for me very important. 
but also the whole organizational structure of um, uh, a circus is interesting. A circus is not only about artists, when they make artistic circus at least, or artistic knowledge, it's also an economy. It is also about a doctor who is in there. Uh, it's also about politics, it's negotiation. We want to put our tent here again and again. Uh, and it is making this kind of autonomous space. But what I, what I mean by this is, this is, this, this autonomy of, of, of art is made in a very heterogeneous way. Now, that's the very kind of paradox. You negotiate constantly with other social fields and you even involve them in your organization and your project to make your autonomous uh, uh, project. Which is, I think, very interesting to think about because this whole question of autonomy is not just or only an artistic question. It is nowadays the question of lawyers in justice system. It's the question of doctors, surgeons in hospitals, etc. We did one uh, summer school two years ago in Antwerp in the museum Middelheim, which was called Mobile Autonomy. A typical summer school for a young artists who just finished their studies, etc., etc. The first evening, we did also public le lectures in the evening. The first evening, there was one surgeon. And the last evening, there were 10 surgeons. And they said, yeah, you are talking about us. And we said, what? So we are talking about you? Yes, we also don't have any more anatomy anymore. We cannot decide anymore when we have to search or not. What is a good surgeon at a certain moment out? We have to count how many surgeons we have to do to be a quantitative because the management says. And it's the same discussion. And I think this is a, a very important angle also for artists, I think, to find allies with other kinds of subfields in society who feel also touched in their own autonomy. I have a, a, a lawyer who lives next to my door, it's my neighbor. She says the same. In, co in court nowadays, I have to count how many files I need to do every week. I, uh, so I have no time anymore to decide autonomous what justice is or not. So I think the problem is shared. And from this shared problem, we can make also, I think, much stronger positions for culture and arts in society, because the discussions where we are busy with are shared. Are they, they, at least we can recognize, or people rec recognize, even nowadays politicians, when you talk with them. Because this really recognize that there is something wrong with the autonomy of politics, which is very important that there is an autonomy of the parliament, autonomy of political decision making. Again, this comes all together in the circus in this kind of heterogeneous organization uh, of negotiation. Uh, a last artistic example, my favorites of the moment, this is Resetas Urbanas, uh, which means recipes for, for the urban space. It is a collective for artists, circus artists, but also architects. And they build constructions like this. Uh, they build houses, they build schools, where people ask where it is necessary. And most of the time, it's completely illegal. That's why they look like this. They have to look mobile. That they are. So they are making between the zone of what I call creativity and criminality. This very they making space there, and the aesthetics is the result of their intervention. But what they also do, they organize, they need to organize them, very heterogeneous. They talk with, and they organize themselves also with lawyers, with politicians, uh, with economists, to make this kind of institution possible. It's a huge thing. Eh? This, this, uh, they started with two. They are all over Europe now. They have their own, their own economy and also network of, for example, exchange of cheap materials uh, to build cheap houses, but also to exchange law uh, information, uh, uh, information about regulation and how you can manipulate. Uh, uh, but also very interesting is what they said. They gave a lecture in Antwerp, and they started with uh, with, uh, with this word. They said the first thing is said. They said uh, for uh, the first words of the lecture was, "Know your constitution. You can use your own constitution against the ruling politics again and again because they don't 
follow the constitution. And they give just one example. They build a school, illegal, uh, but they made a kind of workshop with the students. That was their way to, to slip in the system. But then, of course, the police came in, etc., and they said, yes, in our constitution is that there is freedom of education. Remember. And they build up a whole process to realize, uh, to realize this. So this is very, I think this is very important, this kind of mixture of knowledge, heterogeneous knowledge in making such new constitutions. And that's also why I call it not anymore institutions in common, is it also together. Uh, you have to do it uh, with, with a lot of soulmates. And don't forget, we have a lot of soulmates also even in private business. More and more you recognize them uh, uh, in it, but you have them also in law, etc. They often say, this system is fucked off. And then you have it, then you have the feeling of, okay, we have to do it. Just one example, what they also did, very interesting, I found, in Sevilla, they discovered that, uh, that um, uh, the space between the root of a tree and the leaf of a tree is not regulated. So you can do there what you want. So what they did, they built at, uh, uh, at the stem of the, of the tree, they built for all the homeless uh, um, small houses in which they can sleep at night. It's a beautiful cocoon, it's a beautiful uh, architectural structure. And the police could stand to it and look at it, but they could do anything. They made, again, public space for them. And I think this is a very important thing uh, again, to uh, uh, to think about it, and also I like very much this this mixture of they really are autonomous. Eh? They make their think what they want to do. They make artistic autonomous works. That's what they do, but they reframe it and they make it also legally uh, and or in an orga organizational way possible. So as a consequence, and to end, it all don't it all starts there. I think it's it's giving children the possibility to define their own space through art, to paint. I'm happy that's not my living room. But anyway, this is, this is really what, what, those, what those children do. Of course, they are not conscious of what they, what they are doing. Uh, but I, I, I like this very much because look at the television. It's still playing. They, they, they say, not, not for us. We make our own space, not this, not this role playing. We do it in our way. Of course, this is very metaphorical and symbolic, but I, I think this is very important to have this also in an art school, to stimulate students to say, redefine your own classroom uh, and do it yourself. And of course, take the consequences. This means also you will have heavy discussions. You maybe have fights with the director, and maybe you are sent out, etc. But take the risk and negotiate, and learn to negotiate also with the lawyer, with the politician, with the director, with the bureaucratic manager, uh, etc. I think this is a very important thing. I think you can also learn uh, uh, students nowadays. That's it. Thank you. If uh, maybe someone has an urgent question, but uh, also I think that everyone has a lot of questions after uh, this lecture. Okay, uh, I propose we continue now and then uh, probably we can also uh, kind of relate and connect the questions with tomorrow lectures. Uh, just you want to comment? Just have a small question. Do uh, you think those spaces can be created also digitally? Ah, you th do you think so, those spaces can yeah, be digital uh, spaces? Yeah, that's that's another lecture and another book also. Uh, but uh, um, no, but it's very important. It's a very important question. Uh, and, and it reminds me that I forgot to say also something else. But uh, let's first say that and then First of all, I think we never can go back to the first scheme. What I mean by that, that we never can go back 
that there is a kind of institutional protection of those four separated spheres. That's, that's one thing. Second thing is, can you organize this on the, uh, your question? Can you organize it on the internet? Yes and no. Um, I think the, the internet is a very beautiful, um, gives beautiful opportunities to organize your own spheres. But there was a kind of critique on Manson. I just stopped that. You cannot eat apps. And what I mean by that is you can organize and put in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, on the internet beautiful wild ideas, make public sphere. But it, in my eyes, it can never be a civil sphere. And the civil sphere is where you uh, roll up your sleeves and you do things. For me, the, the civil sphere for the internet is, is uh, the hardware. It's where it, may, it are the cables who you, you put there, etc. So the internet can be a beautiful public sphere where you have IDs and exchange IDs, where you uh, try to make an autonomous uh, space, but you cannot eat apps. <laughs> so to live of it, you really have to do uh, or you have to have an, uh, a life in a physical space. That, that's my own, uh, but also, I mean also to change politics, you need to uh, 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 do things in the physical space. But anyway, it can be very help, helpful. Eh? And uh, we see it also. Uh, uh, internet is very helpful in, in, uh, um, in the mirroring processes. People copy uh, civil actions of day. It's, it's a huge uh, manual of, of uh, civil actions and how you can organize it and how you can organize also autonomy uh, again when you look at the internet. So it's, it's a beautiful service, eh? uh, let's say it like that. But for example, Facebook is also public space. Uh, everything is like and dislike. That's the start of an opinion. It's an opinion, eh? like and dislike, but it is completely, of course, uh, uh, commodified and, and, and controlled also. And that's the, that's the huge problem, I think. Uh, uh, pretty interesting.